When we invest in climate resilience and infrastructure, we create opportunities for everyone. That's a, the heart of my jobs plan that I propose here in the United States. It's how our nation intends to build an economy that gives everybody a fair shot. There's a need to modernize our infrastructure. There's a need to invest in uh, child care. There's a need to invest in early childhood education and making the, our kids and the workers of the next generation more competitive. That can be on the backs of the wealthiest Americans who can afford it and uh, corporations and businesses who can afford it. Uh, and his view and the view of our economic team is that uh, that won't have a negative impact. Bring in our panel, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, Leslie Marshall, Democratic strategist, and Katie Pavlich, news editor at townhall.com. Great to see all of you tonight. Hey, Shannon. Hi, Shannon. Great to be here. Okay, so we now have some back and forth, some proposals from the Republicans, but Molly, before we get into this next multi-trillion dollar package, have we defined infrastructure here in Washington? Apparently, everything is infrastructure, according to the Democrats. But what I'm just so fascinated by is it was not that long ago that we had a campaign where Joe Biden was presented as a moderate, as a unifier. His campaign message was that we had had division under Donald Trump and we needed unity, and that's why you should elect him. He won by 40,000 votes in three states. The Senate is tied. The House is controlled by just like a half dozen Democrats. And yet he's pushing through such a radical far left agenda that it's absurd. And I think the backlash is just going to be stunning. You know, you look at previous Democrats who really tried to do this level of change, they really did have a mandate. FDR controlled the House by like 200 votes. The Senate, he had a two-to-one majority and he'd won in a landslide. That's not the case with Biden, and yet he's, he's governing as if he did have a mandate and pushing through these radical ideas with so much division and racism, you know, coming along with it. It's, I really think there's going to be a major pushback and a major electoral reckoning in the days to come. Well, traditionally, we know that a president, uh, the first midterm after his election, is generally not good for him and his party. Leslie, uh, are Democrats worried at all about the more progressive pull for President Biden and how it could translate at the uh, ballot box? Uh, no, because uh, Joe Biden is a moderate. I, I, I find it funny that people are thinking that it's progressive. Let's look at some of the things that are progressive. Two things in particular that he campaigned on. Universal pre-K, that is approved by 84% of Americans, 73% of Republicans. I guess they've become progressive. And then you have uh, paid family leave, not just our own Jesse Waters who likes that, uh, but 80% <laughs> of Americans support that. Again, a lot of conservatives support that as well. And as a matter of fact, treasurers, uh, state treasurers, from 17 states are saying, please, we want this because there are nine states in the United States that uh, already have this. Look, this is a AOC and Bernie Sanders would laugh if I said this was a progressive uh, bill and legislation that's being put forth. Expensive, big price tag. Republicans don't like that. Absolutely no question. But at the end of the day, these are things that Joe Biden campaigned on, and a lot of them have a majority of support of voters on both sides of the aisle. Well, Katie, to that point, what we're hearing from this administration is that these are things that are supported with bipartisan support. Now, they are now redefining that to not mean actual elected leaders like Republicans on Capitol Hill because they're getting things done without Republican votes. How do you de define <laughs> yeah. bipartisanship? Well, people will support a lot of things in the first question when they're asked, but then when you ask them if they have to pay for it, they tend to change their mind. And that has to do with a lot of what's in the so-called new human infrastructure plan on top of the hard infrastructure plan, which actually doesn't have a lot of real infrastructure projects in it. So this is not just about Joe Biden and the lie that he was a moderate on the campaign trail and that he would govern as a moderate in a bipartisan fashion. This is about the, uh, the idea that the White House House is still trying to argue that corporations and small businesses can raise their taxes and pay for this endless amount of spending in Washington, D.C. on programs that are designed not to just, you know, not necessarily to benefit the American people, but to, to enlarge the federal government, which we all know uh, can never really be taken back in terms of cutting down its size. The fact is, if they want to pay for this, everyday Americans, the middle class, are going to pay for it through things like gas taxes 
taxes that they floated, through death taxes that there that would be in this uh, these these bills to pay for these types of things. These these proposals will affect middle class Americans who are just getting by, who maybe have lost their businesses trying to come out of the pandemic, and yet they're still trying to sell it as if only corporations and biz big businesses will pay for it. That's not true. Everyday Americans will pay for these plans. Well, one of the other things they're talking about trying to get done on the Hill, which they've been talking about for months and months, is some type of police reform. Uh, clearly, the recent events are going to re-escalate and reignite that conversation. Uh, Molly, they didn't want to get it done last year with Tim Scott's uh, bill. Democrats filibustered it before the election. Where do we go from here on that front? Yeah, they had a pretty good bill last year that they could have worked on and they decided not to because they didn't want to give Republicans a win. But there's a larger question, too, about how to reform police uh, police situations. Sometimes there is a need to do that. And should it be top down from the federal government or not? The Biden administration announced that they're returning to the consent decree approach. That's where the federal government comes in and tells you what you have to do. The Trump administration had tried to move away from that because the previous three administrations had done 70 consent decrees and it wasn't really seeming to be working. They were trying to work with police uh, police to actually reform and improve. But there's a bigger, bigger lie involved here, too, which is being put forth by the Biden administration, that police are creating a dystopic, racist hellhole in America. That's just not true. And all of this action against the police in the last year has actually led to a huge increase in violent crime and homicides. And it is the most marginalized communities that are suffering from this, and it's not being covered appropriately by the media. That's the real crisis that we're dealing with now, not this lie that we're telling about the police. Martisan had an opinion piece in the Washington Post this week. He said uh, that this is a great opportunity for President Biden to show some bipartisanship. He said um, of last year, he, he says now, if Biden makes a choice not to cooperate at this moment on this issue, then his inaugural promise to put his whole soul into United Our Country was nothing more than a lie. A quick response from you, Leslie, and then I want to get to winners and losers. Uh, look, uh, you know, President Biden always said that he was not in favor of neither am I defund the police, uh, that reformation was key. And, you know, I do think this is an area where there is bipartisan agreement, especially when there are people scratching their heads on how a police officer could mistake a, a gun for a taser or a taser for a gun. Uh, the, look, having the consent decree in place is, is not going to uh, bring the federal government in in the way, no uh, disrespect to Molly, that she presented it. Actually, if you look at the way it was done during the Obama years, it was something that was actually very useful to police with regard to reformation. And if you want to look at things under the consent decree, like what happened in Ferguson, that police officer uh, was not uh, okay. was not indicted uh, for his actions uh, with uh, the we death of that young man. We can, we can continue that conversation for a long time, but I want to make sure quickly we get to each of your winners and losers. Katie, to you first. So my winner for the week is the Columbus police officer who helped save the life of a young girl uh, earlier this week. He should be praised. He is a hero. And my loser for the week is the Gwinnett County School Board that got taken to task by an angry mother named Courtney Ann Taylor for absurd and ridiculous uh, mask mandates for, for little children. Quick to you, Leslie. Uh, my winner is my state of California. We are number one in the lowest number of COVID cases despite recall efforts and lockdowns. And my loser, Josh Hawley, not only the only Republican, the only senator to vote against an anti-Asian hate crime bill. Yeah, and he does have an explanation out on social media about that if you want to know why. Molly, finish this up. Yes, my winner is Dana White, who heads UFC. He is hosting a fight this weekend. Uh, 15,000 people will be in attendance indoors in Jacksonville, Florida. He'd really wanted to push back against some of the pandemic craziness, and he's hosting that fight. My loser is LeBron James, who threatened that Columbus police officer who saved the life of the young woman and, and put out some uh, really offensive commentary about it at a time when he should have been showing some leadership. Well, all of us need to take a breath when these things happen. We always learn much more down the road. Ladies, thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon.